Hello, everyone out there, and welcome to Untitled Creative Fusions from here at the Denver Art Museum. My name is Brenton Way. I'm Ramon Bonilla. And what's going to be happening tonight, Ramon? So tonight uh, we'll be presenting a mural that I created for the dam. So uh, the mural uh, is about themes of uh, disparity and the economic crisis, the global pandemic, and social issues. So you'll be able to see a video, and then there will be a Q&A. You will be able to see also three bricolage pieces that I, that I created. And through those pieces, you will be able to see facts about how Puerto Rico is affected by a US Congress uh, approved law from the 1920s, and how that law affects the uh, shipping of goods to the island, and also the, the economy of the island and the people that live there. Awesome, yeah, I'm really excited. There's going to be uh, a fantastic collection of things. There'll be a piano performance, a cappella, but the thing that we really want to impress upon the audience is just engagement. So the theme of our evening is reviewing, and the whole idea is looking at themes of freedom and the threads that bind our country together and our nation together and our world together and the things that separate us and how we can uh, sort of bridge those gaps. Mm -hmm. You know, Ramon, like, I know we're wearing masks right now because we're here live in the art museum. Yep. You know, Ramon, I'm getting, a little, I'm getting a little hot right now, so I'm going to have to take my mask off. Oh, so much better. So much better. So I'm really excited, and I think we should just have a fantastic evening. Yeah, stay tuned for Sign Mountain also. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Hey everybody, this is Andrea, the chef and founder of Four Directions Cuisine, uh, bringing you a mocktail and a cocktail for your summer shenanigans. Uh, I know that this summer is not the summer that we were all expecting, but hopefully these uh, beverages bring a little happiness to your life, even if just for a little bit. So, assuming that your ice does not fly out at you, uh, you're gonna fill your favorite mason jar, cocktail glass, whatever you like, with a little bit of ice. Probably about three quarters of the way. It's summer. You want it to be cold, crisp, and refreshing. Um, I really enjoy Buttons Blue. Uh, they are one of the local whiskey companies that actually uses U Blue Corn in their uh, whiskey making process, uh, which I really appreciate because I also use U uh, Blue Corn. So. You're gonna pop this open. You're gonna measure out about an ounce and a half, two if you're me, of your buttons blue. And about an ounce of simple syrup, lilac simple syrup. And the only thing that makes the lilac simple syrup uh, special is the lilacs itself. I'm a big fan of foraging. Uh, so I take about two cups of wild foraged lilacs and I put it, steep it in a pot of simple syrup. Simple syrup is just equal parts of sugar to water. Warm it up until the sugar dissolves. I put my lilac flowers in there, let it steep for about two hours, put it in a freezer, put it in the refrigerator, store it, you're good to go. Uh, in the refrigerator, it's good for about a month. In the freezer, you can have it for up to a year. Uh, so once you get your whiskey and your simple syrup in there, top it off with about six ounces of club soda. And you can use a f uh, flavored club soda. You can use uh, just a plain club soda, whatever your heart desires at the time. Give it a quick stir. And then I have some chamomile flowers from my garden that I like putting in there that really complements both the starchiness and sweetness of the uh, whiskey with the uh, corn base as well as the lilacs that are in your simple syrup if you choose to do that. Cheers! And that is Summer in the Rockies. Uh, for those of you who prefer mocktails, I have a really fun recipe for you. Do the same thing. Fill a glass or a mason jar about three quarters of the way full with uh, ice. 
I've got some prickly pear juice that I took out of the freezer a couple of days ago. Uh, you can go to your favorite Mexican market and usually find it. Uh, it's really reasonably priced. You're going to cut the fruit lengthwise, scoop the flesh out away from the skin, put it in your blender, your food processor, pulse it a few times, and that's going to separate the uh, juice from the seeds. Strain out the seeds, and then you're left with a really beautiful fuchsia uh, juice from your tuna. So you can use an ounce and a half to two ounces. A little bit more for me again. Set that aside. Uh, I have a uh, cacao juice from uh, prepare, uh, Repurpose Pod. You can go straight to their website and order a couple of containers. I just like doing about an ounce. A lot of times I'll only do a half ounce because there's a lot of natural sweetness in the prickly pear as well as the cacao. Put a squeeze of lime in there, fresh lime juice. And then just like the uh, whiskey cocktail, top it off with about six ounces of club soda. Quick stir, a couple more chamomile flowers. Got a prickly pear mocktail, and you have a summertime in the Rockies whiskey cocktail for when your guests come over. Cheers to summer. Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to the beginning of Untitled. I hope that you have your alcoholic or non-alcoholic drink ready, your water. Um, so I'm here with my wonderful friend and class. And I are going to turn that into some music and some freestyle for you. Uh, and we're going to we're going to go in a lot of different directions, but we're going to do some things that are fun and silly and some things that are more contemplative as well. So um, I think where we should just start off is just Uh, how are you feeling? So this is just our little, your little moment to just tell us uh, how you're doing, what are you thinking about, and I will turn into music. So if you could just throw that in the comments, that would be awesome. And I also am aware that there's a slight delay, and so I uh, love, it's amazing that Angela is just uh, an amazing improvisational musician, and so she'll hang while we wait for our comments here. Someone said our audio went off, should be working now. Thank you so much. So I'll... Ah, okay. Someone said give the prompt again. Um, so I'm going to ask you questions, and you are going to respond in the comments. And so uh, right now I'm just asking. How are you doing? What's been on your mind this week? And Angela and I are going to turn all of your comments and prompts into music. So, okay, we have a few, got a few comments. You want to groove with it, Angela? Do I want to what? You want to groove with it? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. So, we're chilling. We got a plan. 
I'm looking at my man Graham because I'm saying he's feeling creative and you know that I could never hate it. He's manifesting joy and manifesting ideas. Graham Tobin, yeah, you know I see ya. Travis, you know it's nice because we are chilling here USB. That was many years ago, but we'll say it twice. So John is feeling good. He's feeling nice, just like he should. Mr. Netzler drinking H2O because right here, this is how we flow. What's on your mind is COVID keeps you at home. Timothy, I know that's where the stories roam. We're feeling a little cooped up here in the building, but I'm happy to be in the museum where we're living. So Donna and John are doing great. It's time to inspire, don't spread hate. So Sign Mountain, feeling good and inspired. Red Truck, feeling grateful, they're feeling higher. Someone's feeling a little sluggish, and it's okay, that's not my wish. But thank you so much, this is a little check-in, and right now we'll just keep going. All right. So that was a little check-in. Thank you so much for just telling us how you're doing. Sounds like some people are feeling sluggish, tired, a little antsy from COVID, which I, ugh, I super understand that. Um, so this is uh, the next prompt that I would love for you to respond in the chat. Um, I know we've had a pretty crazy year, a very crazy year, and I would like to hear what is something that has deeply impacted you this year? Whether it's something that actually happened to you or just something that happened in our greater society. It can be something that has uh, filled you with joy, something that has filled you with sadness, um, maybe something that's filled you with curiosity, wonder. So what is something this year uh, that has deeply impacted you is what I would like to know. And while we're hanging, ooh, Tim was in the early yesterday. Uh, could you give me something groovy, Angela? Be Thanks. Uh, while we're hanging out, waiting for those comments, I saw that uh, Dorian said, tell me about your favorite myths and legends. So while I'm waiting for some comments, I'll tell Dorian about my favorite myths and legends. Um, Dorian, so many. Okay. So, listen, legends, we know it's on. I want to heal just like Chiron. It was Matrix before Morpheus. Going down to Hades, it was Orpheus. Because what about going in the sky? Icarus, Icarus, how do you fly? Because what do you do when the world is turning? Look right now because your wings are burning. Because right now it is a myth. It was before Star Wars, before the Sith, it was the Greeks penning on the tables, writing mysteries and writing fables. Hercules, David and Goliath, bring it back like the power of Jabriath. Right now, can we connect? It's the stories we have that intersect. All right, can we do something a little bit more contemplative? Yes. Thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the prompt, Dorian. That was, uh, that was good. What are we yearning? John said I had to adjust to online learning because it's hard to teach the students at home. I have so many teacher friends, I know how you roam. So, so Kelly's realizing new connections. Right now it's intersections. Kiara saying grateful to get out. When you step outside, you have to be a shout. Mr. Nets is feeling confused. That's the world we live in. We have to get used to it because right now, as the world turns, sometimes it feels that it's the world burning. Someone's talking about teaching kids at home, giving them the knowledge when they're running around in the dome because how do you be a parent and a teacher? It's hard like being a, a talker and a preacher, like a singer, do we sing times? Because right now we're committing lyrical dimes. It's you and us connecting over a screen because right now we are living it lean. The good old days, Dorian said he's loving it. And just like the lyrics together, we're rubbing it because we're starting a fire together, taking it to heaven because show me the weather. You know, I just, somebody said they knew it. It was the death of John Lewis, an American hero, an American icon. I shed many tears and I learned he was gone. May he rest in peace, RIP. Because right now you're in the sky, you're free. But now the work continues. We have to do it in your honor, do it for you. Because right now you're not doing it hard. Someone is laying and painting your boulevard. Hey, I'm not sure what that means, but stay safe in the streets, right in the scenes. Someone's watching from the Philippines. Maybe I can say hi in Tagalog, you know what it means. Because it's all over the world, because right now the mystery is unfurled. Ramon, someone's saying hello. 
maybe from a nice good fellow because right now someone's saying it's too much, too much, because right now we can give you the world just like it is such. It's a new level each week. What's gonna keep happening? I don't know, but right now I'll keep giving verses and rapping. Someone said Obama's eulogy, it was a connection just like you and me. He said we have to continue the work. He said we gotta continue the work. Uh, let me be clear. We have to move forward and we have to stay together uh, as a country. And we do. And he's right. So, I want you to keep, keep the comments coming. The prompt was, um, what is something that has deeply impacted you, had a profound impact on you this year? Whether it's something that happened to you, something you observed, something in your family. And we're actually going to change it up a little bit. So, I've been hanging out doing some, some freestyling. But uh, Angela is an amazing pianist. And so I am going to pass it off to her and I'm going to read off your comments and Angela is going to musically interpret them while I hang out. So let's start with, uh, Angela, let's start with Tracy. She says beautiful bird songs. <laughs> Stefania says Obama's eulogy for John Lewis. Fantan, Ben Fantan says, being separated, but feeling close. <laughs> Thank you for the, the props on the Obama version. Uh, Alejandro Antonio Fuentes Mena says, the storytellers trapped in the basement of the Denver Art Museum. Someone says that's a big piano. Yes, it's a grand piano, in fact. Um, Ramon says space is the place. Uh, <clears throat> and then the last one I'll give you, Angela, is Alex says getting used to celebrating life events, but in a different way. So milestone birthdays, graduation, but unfortunately not in person. Perfect. So, actually, I'm gonna give you one more, Angela. So Joe <laughs> says, the Michael Jordan documentary, resurrecting the deep 90s nostalgia. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, uh -huh. I, I think that's, that's a good one too, uh, for me to jump back in on that. Um, okay, so this is what we're gonna do now. Um, so, for the last five minutes here, unfortunately, this is a, a shorter version of what we normally do, but we're super excited. We're just gonna give you a grab bag. So what the grab bag means is you literally get to throw in absolutely any topic that you want into the chat box, um, whether it's something that you've been reflecting on during COVID or this social moment, whether it's just the last movie that you watched, um, or maybe it's your kids running around and driving you crazy. But this is the grab bag. This is your opportunity to literally do whatever you want. And we're gonna weave it together for the next three and a half, four minutes. Um, and I'm gonna start with these last couple that we didn't get to. All right. So grab bag it up. So. We go and we grab bag it up. Like no diggity, I'm saying what's up. Because right now I don't want to be a hog. Lauren says it's the joy of rescuing a dog. Hannah says go wash your hands. That's how we do it, that's how we plan. Because right now, you know I'm getting fixed to be Joe Ali, Mike Jordan, that's a 360. Hanging with my tongue in the air. The best player at 23, it just ain't fair. Because right here, I'm in my court stance. Why don't you and I have one more dance? The last dance, call Phil Jackson. And then we'll go and we'll jump into action. You know I'm not feeling obscene, I'm clipping 
turning upside down while I'm doing trampolines because right now you know I'm feeling it because right now Hamilton's going in how does a bastard orphan go hard how do we go how do we deal the cards because I'm jumping in the room where it happens and the audience is going and we're clapping and we're clapping it's Alexander Hamilton does he feel it Alexander Hamilton yes do we reel it we're bringing it back right now why do you write like you're running out of time how so I hope it's raining in here enjoy Sun Mountain just leaving it clear because you know we're just not hopping I'm in the store doing some face mask shopping we are gonna get mascara for my eyes that's the only part you can see ha surprise but it's okay this is how we stay safe because right now you know I'll play a game I'll just straight everyone's always singing ham Alexander ham because he's got the plan because Aaron Burr before Ben Hur but it's okay because that's how we incur someone said and best is as best as test was negative well that's incredible that's incredible news that's incredible views because right now you Yes, I'm saying the views, it's the Macarena, that's how we do the dance. Give me some maracas, cause it's right in the plan. Cause I put my arm right on my shoulder, cause right here we are feeling so bolder. Ask me what's the rub, what's the next book I'm reading at the book club? Hmm, I gotta say, oh lord, the last book at book club for me was Jesmyn Ward, an amazing author, two-time national book winner, and never a sinner. So, it's all good, it's right where we roam. Jesmyn Ward taught us to salvage the bones, so we're hanging. And the keys are banging. There's so many comments. I'm trying to go to the bottom. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is the last couple. So if you want to get in, get in the grab bag. This is the last like 30 to 45 seconds. Okay. So open the bag. It was a fail. Mimi says my potato chips they were stale. Was it Lay's? Maybe Fritos? Tell me the secrets. You know that we know. Because right now, it is in our nation. Can we connect with each other? Can we be patient, be vulnerable, able to be wounded? Because right now, that's how we move. And that's how we move our spirit. That's how we move our soul. That's how we step up. That's how we get on a roll. Because right now, I'm not having a fit. Dr. Fauci, he did it for all of us. And look at his uh, impression on SNL. It was by Brad Pitt. He was an amazing Fauci, an amazing doc. Because right now, we go hard because it's TikTok. Someone's saying freestyling faster than the topics. Oh, Dorian, it's too nice. I'm saying just stop it someone says be play, be patient be flexible because right now that's how we testable we test each other but we connect because right now the souls is how we intersect so i'm at the end here thank you for your time because right now we committed the crimes now we just connected with some rhymes Whew. you guys gave me a run for my mental money um but thank you so much for hanging out with angela and myself uh, doing some verses for humanity and uh, stay tuned there's a lot more amazing content um, you'll hear from Ramon talking about his mural there's some acapella later and a lot of other amazing things so stay tuned and thank you for being here peace and greetings y'all my name is Quinn AKA Othello Gold Chain, AKA Slim Monaco, AKA the Pope of Dope. My name is Tina, AKA Tina Bobina, AKA Auntie Bustdown, AKA Cardi T. Hey. Hey. And we're here on behalf of the Black Actors Guild, um, speaking for Untitled. We are here at the Denver Art Museum in the Norman Rockwell Imagining Freedom Gallery. And we're here in the final contemporary space, Imagining Freedom Now. And we're here to discuss a few paintings. The first one being... Erasure 4 by Ana Teresa Fernandez. This piece is talking about the 43 students that disappeared in 2014 in Mexico. Um, they're kind of ruled as a disappearance, even though it's pretty clear when you read the stories that they were murdered by the government. And she did this in protest to the fact that in 2014, after all of that happened, a lot of people on Facebook and other social media places were uploading black squares. Where have we seen that before? Ooh. But um, she wanted to kind of do this because people were posting those black squares, but they didn't truly understand or feel what it felt like to disappear and to not be seen and not heard. So she took it upon herself to paint her whole body and black acrylic paint up against a black backdrop, which was super awesome. It also can relate to current times with the Black Lives Matter movement and how a lot of people have been posting the black square in solidarity, even though a lot of people, they'll post the black square and they just kind of keep stepping and it doesn't really do anything or mean anything to them. So this, she kind of felt the same way about the black squares from 2014 and was like, you know what? 
I'm done seeing all the black squares. Let me actually do something about it and see how it feels to be in those shoes of being erased. Uh, this is the fourth one of uh, four pieces that she um, took as hyper-realist paintings from her screen grabs of her video, which is super interesting. You should watch it. Um, Quinn, I'm interested in regards to uh, you and personally, what does this piece speak to for you as an artist? Sure. So like you talked about the protest and for me as the artist looking at the process, I think of oftentimes we see things happening in the world and we feel so much and especially going into quarantine where you're like, yo, now I have all this time. Mm -hmm. I need to create something that speaks to this. And then also being like, Oh, I gotta take care of myself. I don't have anything to say. The anxiety, the existential mm -hmm. dread, that's a lot to deal with. So um, and then, of course, all of a sudden, 2020 coming at you fast from many different angles. Mm -hmm. The Black Lives Matter protests hit, and it's like, yo, not only am I a human being, I am a black human being in America. And you get all those messages from friends, well-meaning friends, like, hey, things are messed up. How you doing? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I don't even know what to say to that, let alone how do I speak to the world, although... Of course, as an artist in the heart and the head, there's so much happening. So I just love the fact that she was like, there's so much mess. Mm -hmm. And she embodied that mess by taking this paint and covering herself in it. And I think when you feel like you want to create art, you have to really like think about what is the commitment I'm going to make to this piece? Mm -hmm. And she truly put her body on display to commit to the mess. And I love that. And I think about the process that we're doing with Hype Man right now, uh, trying to put on a theater play in a socially distant world, it's like, mm -hmm. that's just a whole new level of mess that we have to step into and have to trust one another to like help stir the paint, mix it up, and then individually put the paint on ourselves and then ask for help from one another, like, hey, help cover me, cover me in this. Get my neck. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll increase it like right there where yeah. I can't touch on the back. Um, so I'm just struck by it that it's a metaphor on a socio-political level, but then it really just speaks to me as an artist, like, how far are you going to go to say anything? Mm. Um, and then I think about... So on a grander scale in terms of America, like the ownership, I think so often when you create something and put it out there, it's no longer yours. So how do you process like creating something and then giving it away or then also like being an admirer and fan of art? How do you take things and interpret it like the way you did with this in terms of Black Lives Matter? Yeah, um, definitely, especially with a project I did recently, having to understand that once you release a project, it's no longer yours. I mean, it is, but it's just, it's out there for interpretation. It's no longer something that's sitting there and safe and like, you know how you're interpreting it and what your meaning behind it is. But then once it's out, you hear things that you might not have even heard, you know, in a way that is being interpreted and be like, oh, what? I didn't even think about it like that. Um, in regards to this, when I first saw it, I didn't, I didn't fully understand the context. So reading that and reading deeper into it, it just struck me even more because it's crazy when artists make something that's relevant for their time and then it's able to transcend that time and continue on and be important and be relevant, that's super awesome for this. And I really am wondering what she's thinking about right now or if she's thinking about these pieces like, wow, the black square thing is happening again? Like, whoa. Yeah. Um, so that's really interesting. And also just personally in regards to um, the bigger exhibit, I feel like this piece can relate to um, freedom from fear because it's, it's more so like in opposition to freedom of fear because the people that did disappear and that were murdered they didn't have that same freedom to have the freedom from fear mm -hmm. because they were obviously living in fear. If they were protesting and had things they weren't okay with, they weren't living free from fear. And so this is just a really interesting opposition to the, you know, everybody deserves that freedom from fear, but people are still not getting it, especially people mm -hmm. of color. And so that's really interesting. I think of that as like a symbol that those 43 students disappearing, like that is a symbol to everyone else who is protesting or being activists like this can happen to you as well absolutely and we look at like black lives matter especially right now with like secret police forces in portland Perfect. that that is just letting everyone else know it's like this can happen to you easily you can film it on your camera phone put it on the internet mm -hmm. and we ain't afraid to still do it so um it's nice to be able to dive down into the mess of it 
For sure. Yeah, this is super awesome. You should go check out the rest of it online. There's more um, screen grabs and hyper-realist paintings by Anna, Anna Teresa Fernandez. Sorry. Um, and there's also an accompanying sculpture and a bit of text as well. So definitely look into it if you're interested in this. Our second piece today is Better Homes, Better Gardens by Carrie James Marshall, painted in 1994. This is part of a larger series called The Garden Project. This piece really speaks to the relationship to Black America and public housing. Especially, he grew up uh, in the Watts area of Los Angeles, and the Nickerson Garden Housing Project and had a connection to Chicago during these paintings. Chicago is probably the poster child of failed public housing policy in the United States. I have a personal connection to it because my dad worked for the Office of Housing and Urban Development during the Clinton administration and was instrumental in changing that relationship. He would always say, it's people, not projects. And by the time I think anyone of a certain age can remember Cabrini Green and the Robert Taylor Homes, giant tenement buildings in Chicago during the 70s and 80s that had fallen into disrepair were really like the Reaganomics poster child of urban, urban crime and poverty. And my dad was really like, okay, we're going to have to switch this up. Uh, him and many, many, many other people who are still doing the work today was trying to change a relationship to these giant brick kind of prisons in ways. And this piece really speaks to the beauty that can be found within these places that it's a community. It is a garden that has to be tended to and grown. And he really wants to showcase dignified black bodies in a space that is not overrun with poverty and crime, but a place where, as a community, you can build and grow together. Christina, as an artist yourself within the process, how does this speak to you? Oof. First off, the size, um, because I'm a big Carrie James Marshall fan, but I had never seen one of his pieces in person. So just like the overwhelming amount of like you walk around the corner and it's this big and you can really see the details of the faces and pick up details that you might not have been able to pick up when you're just looking online. Um, for me, it means a lot because I focus on POC in a lot of my art. And this shows that regardless of the situation, regardless of the scenario, black and brown people are always going to make light of it. They're always going to be able to find some way to have a good time. These people are going on a stroll and like they're going through a stroll in a beautiful park when really they're in this, as he said, prison-like situation where they have to live, where there's poverty and it's mostly black and brown people and it's not a lot of upkeep. And so it just means a lot to me because like in the back, we see the sun shining, we see birds, you can assume they're chirping, you know? It's like, there's this plant here that means that there's growth happening, but we know that in reality in these places, it's not the best, yet people are making the best of it. That means a lot. Um, another thing that was really interesting to me that I was able to dive into more when I actually saw the work in person is I thought these little yellow dots were just like, oh, you know, little flowers. But when you look at it closer, they really resemble like a gunshot wound and like the way it drips. And so for me, that's, that's super important and interesting because in these same neighborhoods that are the gardens, which is normally associated with like pretty soft things, there is a lot of violence. There is a lot of poverty. It's a serious backdrop, but like a really lighthearted, beautiful feeling because they're still able to enjoy themselves. And I really, that really means a lot to me because POC always find the way to make light of things. And just something else on my mind, the way that it um, definitely can relate to this whole exhibit is the fact that I think this, once again, is in opposition to freedom from want. Because especially people that live in the projects in these gardens, they don't have that freedom. They don't have the freedom from want because they're constantly put in scenarios where they don't have things that they need or want. And so it's just, it's very interesting that this is amongst other pieces that kind of speak to that narrative mm. or against it. Well, thank you all so much for the opportunity to listen to us rap about art that moves us and <laughs> empowers us as artists. Um, thanks so much to Untitled and the entire Denver Art Museum. We are the Black Actors Guild. I'm Quinn. I'm Tina. Peace. Come through and support art. We love it.
three. Hi, I'm Sai Mountain, also known as Davis Soto. I'm based in Colorado and make experimental, ambient, and sometimes techno music on my modular synthesizer. When I'm not playing live, I'll take little snippets or studies of different ideas I have for signal flow, melodies, and drum beats. I like to record these on video and then manipulate the video so that they suit the theme or idea I had when I was making the patch. Right after that, I'll take the whole thing apart and start all over again. I'll do this about maybe four or five times in a matter of weeks, sometimes in a matter of a day, depending how much time I have. When I'm ready for an actual live performance, I might keep that patch for maybe two weeks. Perhaps I'll record it, perhaps I won't. So a lot of times what you see in here and those little videos that I upload, that's it. I'll never see them again. I might return to the signal flow idea, but usually it's never sounding exactly the same. I enjoy that part of it. I enjoy the tactile part of it as well. There are a few screens in there, but for the most part, Everything you see in here is going to be knobs and voltage, which is a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy my music and the videos. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions about how I make it or if you want to learn more about Modular 2. Thank you so much. Take care. The wall piece is a snapshot of racial and ethnic disparity in the U.S., showing data about employment, wealth, COVID mortality, fatal shootings by police, health insurance, and home ownership. Statistics about these issues were used as reference to produce the lines on this piece and to show the tendencies on growth and decline that the data presents. It was important to be true to the rates and numbers that are part of the data related to the issues that I am presenting. On this wall piece, lines are used to encapsulate areas of information to connect numbers with text, to create a correlation or to highlight areas of information through line repetition. The mural is intentionally cluttered, might feel overloaded and difficult to read, but so is how we get information nowadays. Life is overwhelming for many and hard to decipher, and still, the issues are real and have an interconnection. It is difficult for the oppressed to avoid experiencing all these issues all the time, and for the oppressor it is becoming almost impossible to avoid acknowledgement and responsibility. The wall piece also includes the names of victims of fatal shootings or violence by police or security personnel, as well as two COVID-19 victims that I am more closely connected to. This was not part of my initial intention for the wall piece. It was an on-the-spot idea that came to me 
after most of the mural was completed. The recent protests involve remembering the names of the ones that lost their lives. And so I felt a need to invoke that process through this piece to make the data come alive because the issues are real and the numbers represent people. Welcome back. My name is Ramon Bonilla and you just saw a video of a mural that I created for this project. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer that through the next five minutes and I'll be answering your questions in both English or Spanish, so go ahead and just type your questions. Um, I have one question here, and it's where did you get your data from, and how did you decide what data to use? Um, the data that I use for the mural behind me, I, um, I use from the US Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor, also from Business Insider, and from the CDC. Um, so the, the, the decision that I made to, to use the data was that I wanted to create a complete picture of the issues that we're going through in the world and also as a nation. So um, I felt that all of these issues interconnect. So in order to, to create a powerful statement, I wanted to provide information on employment, unemployment, housing issues, um, the, the pandemic also, so there's numbers on the um, COVID mortality. There's, there's also numbers on, um, let me see, um, I have uh, wealth also and home ownership. So, so there's different areas of, let's say, life and how they um, all affect each other and the, and the people that, that live in, the, is in this nation. Um, I have another question here is, was there something you found surprising in visually representing the data? Um, yes. And, and it was the COVID mortality numbers because usually, I, I feel that usually on the news we see numbers for white African Americans and Hispanics, but I was able to see numbers on other um, races and ethnic groups. So to be honest, I was completely oblivious on those numbers. And, and it's funny because some of the numbers on other ethnic groups were even higher than the numbers um, even on Hispanics. So um, for me doing the, the, the mural as a whole, it was a learning and eye-opening experience. Um, how does your mapping of the data work? It's not an obvious bar pie graph or chart. So I'm wondering if there's a cohesive system in how you map it out. So yeah, I, I mean, the, the way that I work, um, usually there's a lot of uh, improvisation, there's a lot of um, playing with um, the geometrics and lines of the design. So I wanted to do something like that with the information that I was able to get from the statistics. So what I did was that I started using the lines from the statistics and kind of um, referring to how the, the numbers, um, they grow and decline. So, so I look at those lines and then try to emulate those lines, but, but I didn't want to really um, emphasize how the, or, or replicate how those lines actually uh, look. So I was uh, concentrating more on the numbers and where they start and where they end, depending on the uh, times or, or the years that the um, percentages or rates happen. So um, I was able to, to do that. And then after I was able to implement the lines, I started uh, working around those um, uh, lines. 
Is it a departure for your work to include tax? Yes, it is. It's the first time I've done that. Um, what else do we have here? You mentioned adding the names as a spur of the moment decision, how much of your art as is, is planned and how much comes spontaneously like that. Do you prefer to have a plan or leave it open? Um, yes, uh, it, was, it, was, it was something that just um, came to mind. It was a spur of the moment, like, like you said. De donde inspiraste la forma y el diseño del mural? Yeah, where did I get the inspiration and the form? The form came out of the lines of the statistics. What is freedom? As I see it, freedom is a moving target, dependent upon life circumstances and obstacles overcome. To a prisoner, freedom means no longer being imprisoned. To an ex-convict, the meaning of freedom changes to overcoming a system that places a stigma on having done time. My name is Adri Norris, and I'm a Denver-based artist. For the last several years, I've created artwork about women in history. I use their stories as a lens through which to look at the origins of the systems, the policies, and the ideas that affect the ways that we live today. Let me show you what I mean. Sojourner Truth is born into slavery, so right away, freedom for her meant no longer being enslaved. She lived in New York, where slavery was abolished sooner than it would be in the rest of the country. So when her time came, she took her infant daughter and she walked to freedom. However, Truth's former master still had possession of her son, and she eventually learned that the boy had been sold down south. Now this was illegal, so Sojourner Truth found a lawyer to take her case, and she won her child back. Freedom for self had turned into freedom for her family. In time, freedom for family turned into freedom for her people, as Sojourner Truth became an abolitionist in the years leading up to the Civil War. And finally, as she came to experience and witness different kinds of discrimination, freedom for women became one of her goals. Billie Holiday was born well after slavery was abolished and was a child when women won the right to vote. For her, freedom meant an escape from the poverty that separated her family and led her into being trafficked for sex by the time she was 14. She found that freedom in Harlem's nightclubs where she began her singing career. Unfortunately, this came with the challenges caused by racism. Early on, Holiday was limited by where she could perform and with whom because of the color of her skin. Freedom meant being able to perform all over the country, something she was able to do for a time. Unfortunately, the one form of freedom she was never able to obtain was freedom from addiction. Try as she might, Billie Holiday was never able to get off heroin, and after several incarcerations and the loss of her cabaret card, which allowed her to perform in nightclubs and earn her living, she died handcuffed to a hospital bed at the age of 44. Shirley Chisholm was younger than Billie Holiday by about a decade and lived an incredibly different life. Although poor, Chisholm's Caribbean immigrant parents provided her with a far more stable foundation. She was well-educated and went on to help guide others toward a similar foundation through her work in early childhood education. She saw knowledge as a way of gaining freedom. However, she became aware of how poverty affected those around her and she worked in politics to try to help create systemic change. She soon came to realize how damaged the system was, and so she ran for public office in an effort to free herself and her constituents from the forces that made policy change almost impossible. Chisholm became the country's first black woman in Congress in 1968, but was unable to overcome the prevailing racism and sexism that kept her from becoming the first black woman president in 1972. Her time in Washington was fraught with challenges as she did her best to represent the previously underrepresented, the urban poor, black and Latino people of New York. 
Up until her death in 2005, Shirley Chisholm never stopped believing that we could free ourselves from the kind of polarization and intolerance that plagued her career in politics. To truly understand what freedom is, we need to be able to look around and see what is or isn't available to us. We also need to realize where we have more than some and where we have less than others. Are we okay with where we are? Can we do better? Are we helping or are we hindering others in attaining their version of freedom? far um and it's weird to say that it's we're on the the back end of the evening but um it's been really wonderful to reflect on these themes and hopefully you enjoyed sign mountain and ramon's q a and so i'm going to share uh, a bit of a project that i've been doing alongside the art museum over these last few weeks um and this will be before uh, a performance from my acapella group the storytellers and so uh a few, a, a few months ago, I had this idea to really ask myself, how can I connect people uh, across you know, time zones and across regions in a way that's meaningful to them? And so I reached out to the community alongside the museum and engaged in a project called The Other. So The Other was a prompt that we shared with people uh, all over the state and beyond. And we asked them to, to answer one simple prompt, which was to tell us an experience that changed your worldview. And so for every person who shared a response with us, they also got an anonymous response back from someone else who they may never encounter. And so it was a really, really cool project to see the different stories that people had shared and just the very fascinating lives that people have lived. And so I'm gonna take a couple minutes here and I am going to share a couple of the stories that stuck out to me uh, anonymously, of course, uh, through this project. Okay. My best friend had driven past me, past the protesters, to Planned Parenthood so that I could get some information about birth control. She told me that she would wait in the car as I stepped out and a volunteer offered to walk me into the building. I didn't think I needed her beside me until I heard what the protesters were saying. Don't kill your baby. You're going to hell, expletive. I was only there to make an appointment. I would never had to make that choice about my body, but my friend who was with me had. I remember how much she cried when she told me about the little pill she had gotten earlier that year. She and her boyfriend were still teenagers figuring out how to navigate rent, relationship, and who they wanted to become. Though she had always dreamed of being a mother, she knew that she wasn't ready. We didn't talk about it much, but I knew it wasn't a decision that she took lightly. We were at least grateful to live in a state with significantly less barriers than many others. After I booked my appointment, I realized that she wasn't in the car. She had walked across the street to confront the protesters. She's not even five feet tall, but she stood her ground with such conviction in the face of men who told her that her body was not her own. Before we left, um, oh, sorry, I actually lost my place. Um, not her own. How, how could I, uh, sorry, uh, as I walked over to her, I thought about what I would say when I joined her. How would I come up with a great argument and support her? But when I arrived, I lost my voice. I felt uncomfortable and didn't want to add to the already tense situation. Instead, I told her, we need to calm down. Let's go back to the car. Tears were starting to come down her face again, 
but she turned her head so they couldn't see, and also so I wouldn't see. She was angry at those men, but I could tell that she was also disappointed in me, and I was disappointed in me too. Before we left, she stopped on the side of the street where they had set up the big hateful signs. Come on, I need you to do this with me, she said, as she got out of her car to knock down the signs. I was uncomfortable, but I wasn't going to let her down. I summoned all of the courage I had within me, stepped out of the door, and kicked down the closest sign that was near me. And we both got in the car. Before we left, she stopped, and we looked at each other. And I realized that that was the day that I was tested. A friend needed me, and I wasn't there for her. She didn't think I would go through it and stand by her side. And I'm so grateful that she gave me a second chance to support her. And since that day, we have made other hard decisions, some about our bodies, some about other things. But our commitment to one another and to other femmes is stronger than ever. A few years later, I witnessed her giving birth to her first daughter. On that day, I recommitted once again. That was our first story. And I'll share a short one and then one more long one. Here's a short one. Tell us about an experience that transformed or changed your worldview. In college, I was in between classes when we were eating lunch together when a drunk person approached us and started yelling, how are you all alive? We bombed you. What are you doing here? We bombed you. All of us were shocked and couldn't really understand which country this person was referring to, Japan or Vietnam. All of us came from various Asian countries, but none of us were from either Japan or Vietnam. We didn't really think too much about it until much later when I recounted the event to many of my other friends, mostly white, and they all reacted with surprise about how calmly I could recount this story. And our final, our final share for you this evening on the other, an experience that transformed your worldview. When I worked at the War Crimes Tribunal in Bosnia during my first year out of law school in 2005, I was assigned to work with the defense support section rather than prosecution as I had signed up for. I reluctantly worked my first case helping defend a war criminal. And I couldn't help thinking to myself, which was the first case the tribunal heard? During the first day of the trial, in which the defendant was charged with crimes against humanity and several sex crimes, including rape and sexual enslavement, the sex crimes to which the victims were testifying against. It was wrenching. I sobbed in the bathroom during all of the breaks because I couldn't let myself be seen crying for the victims while sitting behind the defendant. I felt awful for helping, for helping to defend someone like this man. Then, out of the blue, as one, victim, as one of the, the victims was testifying during cross-examination, she stopped cold and said, no, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. He was like an uncle to my son. He was my neighbor. I can't do this. The courtroom went cold and quiet, and then erupted into chaos. As it came further on the testimony, a local women's NGO had decided that they wanted to get sex crimes convic conviction precedent established at this first trial. Sex crimes were a huge problem during the Balkan conflict, as they are in so many conflicts, so the impulse was understandable and we figured the defendant was all but sure to be convicted of the crimes against humanity anyway. So the NGO coached the three victim witnesses on their stories in order to be able to get the sexual enslavement convictions at the first trial. In the end, the defendant was convicted, and rightly so, for crimes against humanity. But he was not convicted of the sex crimes, nor would he ever be brought to justice for them. So the human rights lawyer now carries forward a keener, hopefully wiser eye into how justice often operates in our world and fully values the importance of fair and zealous defense of the accused in addition to her own appreciation of what I call justice and accountability. So those were three stories from the many that we received uh, and it was just yeah, a really meaningful experience to get stories of all different flavors and be able to give someone just a small glimpse of the experience of another. So thank you for listening.
So we are the storytellers. We're an all-male vocal quintet uh, here in Colorado. And we use the power of story and song to bring communities together. And so you'll be hearing uh, some songs, some music, and some stories reflecting on themes of freedom and gaining new perspective. Uh, so right now, I know that we're all in a very strange time in our world. And most of us have lost something. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost a sense of rhythm and sense of control. Or maybe you even lost somebody you care about. And so this first song that we're starting off with is one about seeking home. Oh, 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 Traveling through this world alone There is no sickness, no toil, no danger In that bright land to which I go And I'm going there to see my mother And I'm going there, I know where to roll I'm on the go and over Jordan. I'm on the go and home now. I know bright clouds. Oh. to share a brief story with you all, and I'm going to introduce my great friend, uh, Alejandro Fuentes, uh, who I've known for many years, and unfortunately, this is actually Alejandro's last performance with the Storytellers. He's moving away from Denver tomorrow, um, and so he will be missed very, very dearly, but um, he has a story that he would like to share reflecting on these themes, so pass it off to you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Alejandro Antonio Fuentes Mena, 
And uh, one thing that you need to know about me right away is that I am undocumented. And my family is undocumented. And so as I um, was growing up, I thought about whether or not freedom was a real thing for me. Like if you look at the evidence based off of my life, even though I was undocumented and I am undocumented and I grew up in a low income neighborhood, now because I was able to get a job through DACA, I'm now technically middle class. The fact that I jumped from low income to middle class in one generation is not something that is typical or can be done in many other countries. So I had the freedom to do that. But then I compare my situation to what my parents are actively facing today. My parents are still living in a low income status because of their undocumented nature. You see, growing up, what I ended up seeing was my dad, I would go to work with him starting at the age of eight, you know, and I would help him do stucco, construction, the outside of other people's homes. And I remember certain images where, like, times where my literal life and the life of my father was treated as less than. I remember on one occasion... Stucco is a very messy work, and the cement can sometimes fall to the ground. And I remember this one gentleman who, upon seeing the cement over some rocks, some pebbles, said, I'm not going to pay you a single cent until every single rock is cleaned off. And so me and my father spent an extra two or three hours with metal brushes that he gave us, scrubbing at these pebbles and rocks. I remember the fact that my mom would be lured with the promise of over $300 for some uh, caretaking opportunity somewhere. And she would leave for an entire weekend, 72 hours away from her own family. And while she was promised $300 for the work for that weekend, she would come back with only $100 in her pocket. $100 is something that I saw as a slap in the face to me and my family. But for some reason, my mom saw those $100 and she would hold on to them as best as she could. She refused to spend it on herself, even on her own health. Rather, she invested it in me and my little sister because in her mind, any connection to America and the betterment of us was enough of a sacrifice of her own freedom. So I often wonder if freedom really exists. No. It doesn't. To me, freedom is just a facade. Thank you for sharing your story, Alejandro. Um, as a bit of uh, added context, because Alejandro doesn't talk about himself a lot, um, I will add that Alejandro is actually one of the first two undocumented individuals to become an educator in the history of the United States. And so uh, the fact that he's even here and telling his story is a milestone in and of itself. Um, and I remember he and I went to undergrad together and I remember on my graduation day not being sure if I would ever see you again. And so um, I'm very grateful for you. Uh, I just wanna go around super quick and just introduce the storytellers, just tell, tell you our names starting at the end. That's Devin over here. You just met Alejandro. You already know me, I'm Brenton. This is Jerome and that is Keanu. And so we got another song for you. Uh, and this song is in the spirit of what Alejandro was talking about, just about our world being turned upside down and trying to orient yourself in it all. Where are we? What the hell is going The dust has only just begun to fall. Crop circles in the carpet sing. 
sensitivity of this. story for you all and one more song would like to introduce uh, Jerome he is a newer member of the storytellers but we're super super excited to have him and uh, very lucky to have his story as well thank you Brenton um, so my name is Jerome Cibola and I have a confession to make I love Disney movies and especially those cartoons where uh, the, car the characters just burst out into song for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, when I was in high school, I, um, the movie Mulan was released. And in that movie, Filipino Broadway star Lea Salonga sang Mulan's song, Reflection. The song was about her longing for the freedom to be herself, despite what her society dictated she should become. And back then, that resonated with me so much. It still does. Just a quick background. Uh, I was born and raised in the Philippines, uh, which is a predominantly Catholic country. I went to a Jesuit school for 16 years. And I'm gay. Growing up and acknowledging that you're gay in the Philippines was tough. Mainstream media would portray homosexuals as people to be ridiculed, or even worse, feared. And since this was mainstream, my parents used to subscribe to this mentality as well. You know one of our employees? She's a tomboy. Yuck. You know one of your, your, your tito so-and-so? He's a gay. Stay away from him. Be careful around him. Imagine the cognitive dissonance that I was going through. I wasn't yucky. I didn't feel like people needed to be careful around me. But if I was in any way like these people that my parents were talking about, will society be disgusted by me? Will my parents hate me? Now I see that if I were truly to be myself, I would break my family's heart. Eventually, I, I 
I came to terms with my identity, and I came out to my siblings. They were fine with it. I came out to my mom. She told me to not tell my dad. No, things are different now. My parents are very loving people. But back then, what that showed me was that I wasn't supposed to talk about it. Now imagine being around people from whom you first learned to love and thinking that you're not allowed to talk about one of the most beautiful aspects of your being. It was tough. Now, fast forward to when I started my music studies in Indiana University, in the United States of America, the land of the free. It was great. I, I, I met a boy, he fell in love, he wanted to get married. But surprise, surprise, we could not get married in this land of the free. Many people don't realize that the United States hasn't had marriage equality for that long. We didn't achieve it until 2015 because we had to fight for it. In many places in this country, adoption by same-sex couples is not widely accepted. And we're fighting for it. Queer lives are several rungs less important than straight white lives in the land of the free. So we're fighting for it. Now, what has this land of the free taught me about what freedom is? I, I can think of several definitions depending on your situation, but what comes, comes to the forefront of my mind is that freedom is the unfortunate victim of hate. And as we are, as this country is, has been realizing these past few years, Hate is there. Hate has always been there. It never left. And that's why, like Mulan, we continue to fight. We have uh, one more song for you all, um, and then we're going to go to our concluding remarks. We fight for it.
So I go to my brother And I say, brother, help me please But he winds up knocking me back down the Thank you all so much for having us. Um, so we've got one final uh, fun concluding thing to do with everyone. Uh, so in a second, I'm going to invite Ramon to come and join me for some concluding remarks. Um, but we storytellers are kind of known for something here in these parts, uh, and that is our ability to take your input and to create music out of it. And so this is something we've done for a long time. And so while Ramon and I are giving our concluding remarks, what we'll send you off uh, with is a little bit of music. And so if you could do us a favor, would you just write in the comments so kindly, what are you going to be walking away with from this untitled event? Um, is it an idea that you learned? Is it a quote that you heard? Is it a word, an emotion, a thought? Just feel free to put your your concluding word or short statement in the comments, and uh, I will invite Ramon to come and join me. Ramon, how was it? It was fun, and I want to thank everybody for being with us. Um, what, what do you think you're, you're gonna take away from this event? Um, for me, there's, there was, it was a learning experience, even for my own work, yeah. and I hope it was for people too. They were able to see so many different uh, flavors of music and art, so I hope they can learn something new and probably their minds are expanded even more. Awesome. And Ramon, just uh, in short for you, what does freedom mean to you? Uh, freedom, I think freedom is the, the ability to be yourself. Mm to have the space to um, become who you are supposed to be. Amazing. How about you? Ah, that's a good question that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I think for me it's pretty simple. Um, I think it's just having the ability to enact your dreams mm -hmm. and your own vulnerable spirit into the world yeah. without having to fear being attacked in whatever way that so might mean. So, um, so I will invite the storytellers. So what we're gonna do, uh, we did not think of any of this. We didn't plan it, we didn't do anything. Someone is just gonna start something and then uh, people are gonna build on it and then we're gonna make it into a thing. And while storytellers are storytelling, I'm gonna look at your comments. <laughs> Alejandro, Tim Strother says, never stop singing. I agree. Since it's your last show, Dro, you want to start us off? I was thinking about this the other day. About how freedom exists for some, but for others it's just faint. So I think to myself, oh, why don't you come on in? 
Because freedom truly is impossible unless we are united like all the people in here. We gotta find a way to get together and sing. That unity is the key. So freedom is the way we do the thing. Yeah. Let's try that again. Let's go. All storytellers. So freedom is the way we do our thing. All right, all right. Give it up to Brenton, yo. So we reflected. It was a shout. Kelly says it's the fire, the fuel that never goes out. Because right now, we need the fire in the soul. The storytellers, because we put it on a roll. Dorian says we won't be walking away with a thing. We'll be walking towards justice on the wing. We'll be flying up to the heavens. And let's just take it to another level. Take it to 11. And that says it was amazing. Thank you for being here. We did it together and we made it so clear. Someone is telling us about a feeling of joy. When we come together, that is always our ploy. Adam says being apart doesn't mean we're not together. That's right, we weather the storm in any weather. Kiara says a feeling of hope. If we just keep walking, we ain't at the end of our rope. Shelly says moons and suns and rainbows. Because this is how we get together. It's how we flow. Someone says an immense joy of gratitude, Mika, and it's okay because we keep going, we keep flowing. Someone, Aaron, just said love, and we raise it all to the skies above. So right now, from the storytellers, we'll never fall. Freedom isn't freedom unless it's freedom for all. Thank you all. That concludes Untitled Creative Fusions from the Denver Art Museum at home. So please... Leave with our gratitude. Thank you to the amazing museum staff, to Ramon, storytellers, all the creatives, and everyone who was a part of making this happen. So onward we march. <laughs>